careful, fellas. It's said that when you sleep with a woman, you sleep with all the law books that woman has ever slept with. This room is an orgy of poker evidence. As if the chips inside the box weren't enough, there are a few random chips over here, too. And that's before we get to the dedicated drawer of poker books and VHS tapes and the shelf of all poker books. Also, these are terrible hiding places if you're trying to stash some cash. How would anyone ever find your wads when they're in places like drawers and shelves and boxes in plain sight on your desk? Listen, here's the thing. Sneaking out on your girlfriend to play a Russian gangster's underground poker game aeration. If you can't spot the sucker in your first half hour at the table, then you are the sucker. Quiz Show used this quote first, and sure, it's a widely known adage, but the Quiz Show version included Rob Morrow doing some sort of wonderful accent that doesn't actually exist anywhere on Earth. Did Rounders invent an accent? Did it? That's how I've paid my way through half of law school. A true grinder. I had a friend in college who also paid his way through school by being a true grinder. Give me three stacks of high society. I'd have removed every past and future sin of this movie if Teddy delivered him three stacks of porno magazines. So, you're setting the apple. Huh, I guess Rounders did invent an accent. I could take the sin back, but now I just want to see Dick Goodwin in a poker match with Teddy KGB, Steve Martin's The Pink Panther, and Francis Austin from The Devil's Own. The question is, what happens when Herb Stemple shows up? Also, the writer said, let's include poker lingo like sitting the apple that is so abstract that even hardcore poker players will have to look it up. That way, they will know I'm an asshole. Hey, you don't want to butt onions with these guys. Butt onions. No Limit Texas Hold'em is the Cadillac of poker. Is it, though? It's kind of the go-to dependable game that almost every poker player knows how to play. It's really more like the Honda Civic of poker, if we're being honest. The key to the game is playing the man, not the cards. False. I'm going to go ahead and recommend when you play poker to also pay attention to your cards. They come in handy. Also, playing your range, figuring out the other player's range, pot odds, blockers, and playing a specific hand that you call your lucky hand because you won $100 in tunica with it one time. This is why the World Series of Poker is decided over a No Limit Hold'em table. The whole World Series of Poker? The main event is certainly the most prestigious tournament of the series, but it doesn't decide the whole thing. They do this complicated player of the year thing now, where if you go deep in a bunch of tournaments, you have a chance to win it, but you don't automatically win if you win the main event. It's a position that I... I call it. I'll go ahead and get this out of the way now. I'm told the amount that this movie gets right about poker during a time before the poker boom in America is amazing. This hand explains actual poker to an audience in a way that novices can learn and experts know is true. Many poker movies just bluff at that sh**. This movie has the stone cold nuts, which apparently, according to my poker playing cousin, is a good thing. Dealing out a flop that looks like this. This is a crowded flop, Mikey. Give those cards a chance to breathe. But KGB's too smart for that. So what I've got to do is overbet the pot make it look like I'm trying to buy it. But KGB is probably also too smart for that, so he'll know I'm making it look like I'm trying to buy it. So the best thing to do is to check here, but Teddy is probably wise to that too. So as you can see, I clearly can't drink the wine that's in front of me. Ladies and gentlemen, the worst poker tale in all of history. I guess I don't blame Mike for not knowing what this means after the first time, but how many hours of poker have people played with Teddy, noticed him do this, get shown the nuts every single time, and somehow never make the connection? I think at the very least, Teddy would realize he does this. This is not like blinking or swallowing or having a vein pop out of your neck when you're trying to keep calm. The stuff you can't know about yourself that others do know. This is eating f***ing Oreos. Baron in Taran. Either Mike is taking way too long to deal the turn, or Teddy KGB doesn't think Mike knows what to do when he's dealing. Either way, I'm gonna give these experienced rounders a sit. Fifteen thousand time. <laughs> Mike just called time? As if Teddy KGB is on an 8-0 run and his team needs a breather? I want him to think that I'm pondering a call. Yeah, but you could do that without calling time. Yeah, I'm gonna go all in because I don't think you got the space. Toppling all your chips into the pot when all you had to say was all in, asshole. You're right. I don't have spades. This might be the most dickish slow roll since that steamroller ran over Ricardo Montalban at the end of the Naked Gun. I know before the cards are even turned over. No, you actually don't, because Teddy having pocket aces here is ludicrous, even though that's indeed what he has. He could easily have a worse full house with pocket eights, and he can even have nine eight and still think he's got the best hand. Where the f*** is Teddy going? There are other players at the table, right? In this very hand that shattered Mike's dreams of Vegas and the f***ing mirage, at least two guys folded. I mean, is everyone leaving because this is sad? See, I had this picture in my head. Me sitting at the big table, Doyle to my left, Amarillo Slim to my right playing in the World Series of Poker. Dude, you had $30,000. You could have easily entered the main event and maybe a couple of other tourneys while keeping your tuition and case money. But instead, you lost all of it in the cash game because, I guess, you needed more money? McD opens this truck and these boxes are just sitting there unsecured. 
Even if these Kanish King cookies and Kanishes were super heavy, they're still taking a tumble on the first turn he makes in this truck. Secure your load, Mike! Do they teach proper capitalization at this university? What is this, a music video on YouTube? The judge's game. I know we already sent it, but this movie is like 90% narration. Seriously, if you, if you wanted to be a radio play, I've got some coconuts and a slide whistle I can own you. A rotating group of 10 or 12 judges. But not, and I cannot stress this highly enough, 11. Raise. Uh, Professor Raise. Whoa there, Mikey baby. Whether it's poker, Ruffles cheddar sour cream, or my VHS stash of the adventures of Ponch and John, you never touch another person's chips. Well... You were looking for that third three, but you forgot that Professor Green folded it on 4th Street, and now you're representing that you have it. Mikey will go on to accurately predict everyone else's cards, too. Sure, it's fun, but that's not a poker read. That's a superpower. There's no f***ing way he had enough information to correctly call all that bullshit. And this moment is as ridiculous as any time Dom survived a jump from more than ten stories while being fast and or furious. Oh, Mads are killing me. They never used to. Yeah, well, that's different. I mean, that was like... Buy in at 8 o'clock, and next thing you know, it's morning. I'm wondering something. Why did Mike hide all that money that we saw him taking out of video cassette covers and Doyle Brunson's Super System book? It would be understandable if Joe didn't approve of him playing poker before he lost all that money, but Mike clearly came in late in the mornings, and Joe knew about it. Later, we find out that Mike got most of that money from beating Johnny Chan in a cash game. Was he worried about what Joe would think if he brought back that much cash? So much that he hid it in stashes everywhere around the apartment? So instead of coming home, you went and played cards with some judge? The role of the female character, whose sole purpose is to be a paper and wet blanket for the male protagonist today will be played by Gretchen Maul. You had Gretchen f***ing Maul, you bastards, and you blew it. Also, I don't understand this argument. Mike went to the judges game to drop off something for Judge Petrusky. He stayed to call out all the judges' cards in one hand and then left. He wasn't gone long enough to be somewhere else instead of coming home. Saving an old toothpick. It's not so much the toothpick that's the sin, it's the mouth juices that have been gestating on it for the last six to eight years. She's f***ing hot. I was this close to banging her when they sent me away. Uh -huh. She got me into their little game. She introduced me as like her cousin from out of town. Who if you got introduced into this game before you went to jail, how did Mike not know about it if you guys were that close? You couldn't have been introduced to this game very recently, since you just got out of jail today and you've been riding in Mike's car since you got out. I got this feeling. What feeling is that exactly? You know this feeling very well, okay? You know when you got your table all set, you just don't have the steak. This is a steak pun, but how does a situation where you don't have a steak on your table constitute a feeling in any way whatsoever? This is the longest journey anyone has ever undertaken to make a pun in the history of mankind, and its entire foundation is faulty! Since I'm pro-pun, you might think I'd love this poker-flavored wordplay, but I assure you that I'm anti. Anyway, it's 2.20, so that'll get you started. 220, I mean. Worm is so unlikable right out of the gate. I mean, sure, that's kind of the point, but this asshole shames Mike for not playing, takes the free ride, hits him up for money, and then balks at the amount. At some point, this over-the-top stain of a human starts to wear off on Mike and our ability to like him as he continues to put up with it, right? Because walking in here, I can hardly remember how I built my bankroll, but I can't stop thinking of how I lost it. You can't remember beating Johnny Chan in a huge hand at the Taj Mahal? Because that's exactly how you built your bankroll, and that doesn't seem like something too hard to remember. Worm and I fall into our old rhythm like Clyde Frazier and Pearl Monroe. 30-year-old Washington Bullets references. I mean, technically 50 years now, but I was trying to be generous. <laughs> generous. Now, some people might look down on Worm's mechanics, call it immoral. But as Canada Bill Jones said, it's immoral to let a sucker keep his money. Ah yes, the old, if people are stupid, we should take advantage of them defense. That's like chapter one of any worthwhile ethics course. I think Immanuel Kant had a version of it in his early works. Also, Canada. A few times I have to fold the case hand just so it won't be obvious. This scene goes super into the weeds with poker terminology, and they aren't even playing Texas Hold'em in this scene, playing Chicago High, which is a stud game they don't even show the entire time. I know the movie wants to keep its poker simple, so it doesn't get into deep explanations about the other game's play, but it would be nice to just once see how any other scams work alongside some visual aids of the game they are playing. All right, 300, that's your cut. Barbara told Mike that she takes 25% of the cut at the end of the night, which means Mike and Worm ran about $300 into around 1,200. That's pretty good, I guess. But they were cheating. And while Mike had to lose on purpose so that they wouldn't think anything was fishy, it feels like a $1,200 profit is a little small. I mean, we'll just get a finger up your spine. Promise? Why are there two screens displaying the same video stream? Is one of these screens for redundancy, in case the other one goes out? Movie's been hiding Fomka Johnson from us for 32 minutes and 15 seconds. She's really got him by the balls. It's not so bad, is it? <sighs> Depends on the grip. It does not. Tell me you were out drinking till you threw up. Tell me you were getting lap dances over at scores. That's right, Joe just sinned to him because this scene did not include a lap dance. We told you that was a real thing. Not paying attention to the room you're showering in. How does he not see her? Do you want to get baitsed? 
Because this is how you get based. Even though Joe makes it super obvious that she found Mike's poker money, he has no idea that she knows about it until she tells him she found it. I'll act as lead counsel. Movie makes it seem like Mike's been f***ing up for a super long time, but he picked up Worm from prison just yesterday. Everything about Mike before this tells us he's been diligently working on his law degree. Now he shows up late to one meeting and this woman's like, I'll take lead counsel since your boyfriend's such a f*** up. What am I talking about? If you want to see this seventh card, you're going to stop speaking f***ing Sputnik. That's Russiast. Why don't you give me all of it? Usually credit players only leave with their profit. But this is her call, right? What does he say that's so convincing that she just loans the loser two grand? Just give him his eight and tell him to scoot his boot. I mean... You can use a cooler phrase than scoot your boot, but you know what I'm saying. Also, she ends up putting this loan on Worm and Mike? But when was that arrangement made? Mike wasn't even there when she gave him the starting to stack to begin with. Everyone in this movie is terrible! Everyone! Why do you think the same five guys make it to the final table at the World Series of Poker every single year? The same five guys is a bunch of bullshit. even in 1998, when the fields were way smaller than they are today. Sure, Johnny Chan made three final tables in a row, and Dan Harrington got there a couple of times, but this sounds like someone who's stuck in the early 70s when Johnny Moss, Puggy Pearson, and Doyle Brunson would regularly make it. And there were less than 20 people playing. Does that apostrophe here mean that Billy has possession of the topless? Or that Billy is topless? Because one is a strip club and the other is just random information that I'm not sure I need. Teddy's got plenty of goons. Why would he put you under his flag? Because as soon as he heard your name, he became real excited for the prospect. And that's all the movie has to say about Teddy KGB and his interest in Worm. We have no idea what Worm did to Teddy to make him so interested in his debt. But this detail is what leads to Mike going back to poker full time and quitting law school. This Martin Landau scene almost feels like it's in a different movie. But it's one of the best. In a kind of role reversal, Petrovsky reads Mike's character and realizes he doesn't want to be a lawyer. He sees how Mike lights up when he talks about poker. Let's remove a sin for the great Martin Landau! I always told her she'd be a good card player and know exactly when to release a shitty hand. Quick question, what are we supposed to be rooting for here? Them to get back together? Him to fall into terrible old habits with a terrible old friend? The answer is probably for redemption against Teddy KGB by embracing his skills, but what the f*** does any of this Joe nonsense have to do with that? Uh, you know, if we wanted to take each other's roles, we could have just stayed home. Member of convenient hometown player's table is convenient. I mean, would be excellent at cinema sense. It's like the Nature Channel. You don't see piranhas eating each other, do you? Yes, in fact, it happens often. What? Did you think they just waited for cows to fall in so they could strip them to the bone in 30 seconds? Mr. McDermott, that is a Supreme Court free speech case that has no bearing in the premises. Are we sad that Mikey is blowing this? Aren't we supposed to want him to play poker instead of being a lawyer? And why are these three being so, um, judgy? You, you left me pretty quick there. Make it sound as if it was my decision. I'm all out. Skip! 88 World Series, huh? Nope. A real poker player would call it the 88 main event. The 88 World Series featured Oral Hershiser and a Gibson walk-off for the ages. Chan is trying to sucker him in. By taking his time... Look at the control. Look at that I love how Petra describes this poker moment like she's watching some amazing achievement and athletic prowess. Like, other people in history have slow played the nuts like Johnny Chan did here, but he's doing something magnificent that no poker player before him or since has ever been able to emulate. What's going on? Tomorrow's a week. Petra plays the number of days in a week game so that Mike has to ask what the hell tomorrow's a week means. But, uh, Worm's been around plenty. He's running up just on a seven grand. Again, how is this possible without McD signing off on it? Even if he gave a nod to put him on his tab, how is he not informed every time Worm borrows more money? I could stay. I'll come, I'll see you down at the club. So the story goes that Brian Koppelman and David Levine wrote the Petra character as someone a little rougher around the edges. Maybe not all that attractive. And then somehow everyone dropped the ball in this scene before, during, and after the casting. Anyway, the sin is for folding Fomka before the flop. And now we're into another four minutes of these two going back and forth about the same old shit we've seen the entire movie. You probably love this movie for the bookends with KGB, but honestly, the entire 90 minutes between them with peeting shoulder assholes of Joe and Worm pulling at him could probably have been cut in half. Wow, Grandma's got naked ladies who inspect belts for you at this place. That is classy. I see someone went to the Clockwork Orange School of wearing a bowler hat with pajamas. FYI, you do not want to attend the graduation ceremony. 15 large, five days, or I start breaking things. I Grandma told Worm that he owed him 25000 earlier, and he took the 10000 from Worm that he won at the Chesterfield, presumably knocking the figure down to 15000 But he also said the juice is still running, meaning there's interest on that money that increases the amount he owes each day he doesn't pay up. So my point is, why even bring up the juice in this movie if it never comes into play? Now, 15 grand in five days, man, I can do that. I've gone on rushes like that before. Huh? This is not being a good friend. This is enabling a raging asshole. Being a good friend would be getting him actual help. Enabling a raging asshole would be continuing to click on my videos. Poker montage? I've never even seen her montage. Anyhow, I hate montages. What did you think he had? 
Does he look like a man beaten by Jax? No one knows what the man beaten by Jax looks like today. It is rumored you can hear him in the halls of the Golden Nugget chanting, Why am I the only one? Haunting people near the slot machines. He's not a ghost. Also, what is this game? Mike needs 15,000 in five days and he's playing this game at a small diner. What kind of dent can you put into your debt by playing this game? Can you even make $1,000 playing here? I'll call you 300. There's 1,000. There's 500. I bet you the pot limit. And you absolutely murdered the statute of limitations on string betting this pot. Not that the time it took him to do it matters anyway. Do they allow that sh in these games? Shave break! We have 7,300, Mike. We gotta double that in two days. Talking about your poker winnings that you need to pay a gangster off with in the middle of a barber shop. I figure there's 15 or 20 grand in that room. Okay, if we get even half of that, we're home. So you're thinking about going to Binghamton, a five hour trip from New York City, to play in a game where there is 15 to 20 grand in the room, and you somehow expect to get anywhere near half of it? If there are 17 or so players in the room, that means the average buy in is probably $1,000. You'd have to go on a crazy run. With two tables, you'd be only playing for half the total amount in the room anyway. And many of these guys will be going home as it gets later, further taking your profit out the door. I don't expect Worm to come up with good plans, but surely there are games Mike could destroy that are closer to home and could make him the same amount of money. Hey, fellas! Hey, yeah. Bear. Hey, Bear. Met this guy down at the bowling alley. He says he likes to play little cards. Of all the bowling alleys in all the towns in all the world, Worm walks into the one that has a guy who knows about this game and gets him into it. Now you could say Worm knew this guy would be at the bowling alley, and this is his way of circumventing Mike's wishes, but I think it's more likely that he ran into this guy by chance so the movie could put these characters higher up in the tree. The real question is, why wasn't Bear here in the first place? Why was he wasting time in a bowling alley when there's this awesome 20 to 40 stud game being played? Aren't you supposed to like read us all right? Your <laughs> Law enforcement. I had him. The problem with Mike is, even though he knows everything about Worm, he doesn't think Worm will do Worm things. He should have expected Worm to show up tonight and try and cheat a bunch of cops in a stud game. As soon as he was introduced, he should have been like, Hey, I know you, let's catch up, and then proceeded to tell Worm to get the f*** out of there or he was quitting. But no, he had to play it cool and let the disaster unfold right before him. How come all your moves are so smart and noble and I'm always the idiot piece of s***? Because that's how your characters were written. Duh. Then it's all about feel. What's in your guts? So when the movie needs it to be skill, it's skill, but when it needs it to be intuition, it's intuition. Got it. You never should have vouched for that scumbag. When the guy tied to organized crime who exploits sex workers and who literally kicked a dog earlier to show what a piece of sh** he is is the one making sense in your movie, you may have misjudged your character outlines a bit. Look like Dwayne Bobbick after one round with Norton. 30 year old boxing references. I mean, technically 50 years old now, but I always try to be generous. <laughs> Callbacks. I put it all on the line, that's true. And you know what? It wasn't a bad beat. Wrong. I wasn't unlucky. Incorrect. I got outplayed. I got outplayed that time. You're out of your f***ing mind. Are you telling me you would have folded nines full of aces if you had just played better? Folding nines full of aces when there was only one hand that could have beaten you is a f***ing loser play. I guess even the best poker movies occasionally turn GTO into GTFO. It's like in Casino Royale when Mads tells Bond, he must have thought I was bluffing when Bond called a big bet with kings full of aces and Mads showed up with quad jacks. The insanity of poker movies is that they think the cards are what make a good poker player. When it's a mix of a lot of things, skill, luck, how much work you do away from the table, and for the purposes of this movie, not folding nines full of aces just because the other guy showed you a statistically improbable hand, you results oriented motherfuckers. And then he looks at his cards and he looks at me again and he mucked it. I took it down. Because he played one hand with Johnny Chan and took it down on a bluff, he gambled 30,000 in an underground poker game. One fucking hand. Did you have it? I'm sorry, John. I don't remember. That's a badass thing to say to Johnny Chan, but then you just left. F***ing hit and ran. What does it even matter if you told him what cards you had at that point? When my mother let me leave the yeshiva, it nearly broke her. She knew the life I had to lead. To do that for another is a mitzvah. And for that, I owe. So, is this some sort of mitzvah it forward? I got $10,000. I'm looking for a game. Why would KGB take this offer? Mike wins, KGB just gets the 10 grand he had plus five grand of his own money. Mike loses, then KGB still gets the same 10 grand and nothing else. Soccer. All right. Thousand straight. You're playing a 25-50 game, meaning there is $75 in the pot pre-flop. Why are you betting a thousand goddamn dollars? Take it down. I thought the tell was that he opened up the cookie and ate it when he had a good hand, but why would he need to do it when he has a bad hand? Is the Oreo an oracle? An Oreo -ical? My guess is he has something like Ace King or Queens, and this is the one time he does the Oreo thing when he's about to fold, so Mike will catch on to it later. I highly doubt Teddy does this in any other 50 50 spot, which means this is some bullshit for Mike to notice so he can win later. Catching that Jack on the turn, you got lucky there. 
Yep. It was luck. Mike actually sounds like he doesn't believe the Jack on the turn was lucky at all. Like his skill willed the Jack into being. My main complaint with all this is how the movie's philosophy is play the man more than you play the cards. And Mike is just getting a tremendous run of cards in the hands we see in this final scene. Here's the thing about Teddy's Oreo tell. Does it always mean the nuts? Or does it just mean a great hand? Anyway, the nuts here is if you're holding 2-4, which is possibly more ludicrous than Teddy having aces in that hand earlier in the movie. But what if it means he has ace-three, or even ace-king? Since Mike folds ace-five here, he's betting the farm that the Oreo tell means absolute nuts. Also, I'm not done with this Oreo tell just yet, because it might be the silliest plot twist to ever literally twist. What were the rejected ideas for this idiocy? Blowing a kazoo? Tearing off his shirt and claiming he's the Hulk? Having KGB getting possessed by the actual John Malkovich after he goes through a portal? The rule is this. You spot a man's tell, you don't say a f***ing word. Yeah, Mike, you should listen to your own narration. And usually I'd have let him go on chewing those Oreos till he was dead broke. But I don't have that kind of time. This is a load of f***ing horse shit. First off, he only does the Oreo fortune cookie thing when he has the absolute nuts, or close to it. It takes him roughly ten seconds to eat the goddamn Oreo. You have the time! Let him do that shit so you don't go broke! For f***'s sake! I guess the movie wants Mike to beat Teddy straight up without any tricks, so this is how they go about it. But f***. I'm gonna check, Teddy. The way Mike acts during this entire scene should tell Teddy that he has the nuts, and yet it doesn't. Didn't the movie call out amateurs for acting strong when they're weak, and acting weak when they're strong earlier? And then the protagonist does exactly that, and a strong player like KGB doesn't see it? It hurts, doesn't it? You can't believe what fell. Seriously, if Mike didn't have anything in this hand, he could just fold, right? It's not like he's lost his whole stack. In fact, he's got a lot of money behind. So what am I missing? Have they arrived at the time when Mike is supposed to give back the money he owes and he needs to win this hand? Because nobody ever mentions it. Not the f -er! Phil Hellmuth. Also, the big mystery of this movie is what Teddy KGB's hand is. It's the year so vain of poker movie scenes, since he calls Mike's raise pre-flop, and he plays hands like two forward could literally be anything. Anyway, the sin is for making this hand a mystery and making people guess. He beats me. Straight up. Pay him. Pay that man his money. The Russian accent is terrible, but goddammit, how much would we love this movie if John Malkovich doesn't do this exact performance? His character has a ton of lines people quote to this day, and damn it, I'm knocking a sin off for this legendary over-the-top insanity. Grandma flips the table, but who knows why. He's getting his money back. Maybe he likes beating people up more than getting a return on his investment. Hey, don't for a second think I missed the boxing metaphor movie. I noticed. I also noticed that you had soccer playing when the stakes weren't that high, so this shit wasn't lost on me. Listen, um... Can you give this to Petrovsky? I didn't want to wake him up. It's still a little early. Do you really have that tight a timetable where you can't wait for him to get up and deliver $10,000? Play poker now, dude. You don't have a f***ing schedule. Hey, call me if you need a lawyer. I will. And I will. Glad we're wrapping up this underdeveloped toxic relationship with our final moments of the film. I was really hoping for ambivalence as my emotional finish. So, well done. Also, why would he need a lawyer? Just because he plays poker? Vegas, huh? Yeah. Good luck, man. People insist on calling it luck. Including poker players, not just taxi drivers. It's pretty common. The River Card. Oh, is it eight? <laughs>